All right, so uh, we, are, we are so fortunate to have uh, two discussants endowed with uh, I mean, having um, profound experience and expertise. So uh, first, let me invite uh, um, Dr. Hendricks, who is joining uh, us online from Hamburg. Uh, Professor Hendricks, uh, hello. Guten Morgen. Hello. Well, probably. Oh, is it a bit too big? Or buenos dias, if uh, you wish. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. So uh, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Lee. Um, good afternoon or good morning from, from Hamburg. Um, this year, the international community commemorates 40 years of the adoption of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which invite us to reflect on the achievements of this remarkable international treaty and look into the future. So the theme for this conference is timely. It's focus on the effectiveness of the convention's regime and its uh, prospects with, with due regard to its possible effects on future generations. That being said, I wish to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea and the Korean Society of International Law for their kind invitation to participate as discussant in session four of this conference. I'm sorry that due to uh, urgent judicial work of uh, the tribunal, in particular, as mentioned by Judge Lainsat, a application for prompt release, I was not able to join you in person at the conference. Session four deals with incidental and special proceedings in ITLOS, which refers to a variety of proceedings. On the one hand, the tribunal, like other international courts or tribunals, has jurisdiction, which may be called accessory jurisdiction or ancillary jurisdiction, to conduct incidental proceedings. On the basis of the convention and the statute, the rules of the tribunal provide for the institution of six types of incidental proceedings. Provisional measures, as we just heard from uh, Professor Devaney, preliminary proceedings, preliminary objections, counterclaims, intervention and discontinuance. On the other hand, the tribunal has jurisdiction to deal with prompt release proceedings. As pointed out by Judge Leinsat, these proceedings consist of self-contained proceedings. It consists of independent procedures, not incidental proceedings, and have therefore been included in the rules of the tribunal in a separate section of the rules. Except for uh, provisional measures requests, there have been only a few instances in which incidental proceedings have been instituted. Preliminary objections have been filed in two cases, the MV North Star case and the limitation of the maritime boundary in the Indian Ocean uh, and an innovation um, uh, introduced by the tribunal with respect to these proceedings is the time limit of 90 days stipulated in Article 97, Paragraph 1, 90 days from the institution of the proceedings to raise preliminary objections. A counterclaim has been filed in one instance, the MV Virginia case, with conditions for the filing of counterclaims contained in Article 98 of the rules. Three cases have been discontinued, two by agreement of the parties pursuant to Article 105 of the rules, a prompt release case, Shaisiri referred to case 
and a provisional uh, and a, sorry, a case on the merits, the MT San Padre Pio case. And yesterday, at the request of the applicant, by virtue of Article 106, Paragraph 1, an application for prompt release was removed from the list of cases. Now, no application has been made uh, pursuant to Article 96 of the rule preliminary proceedings with regard to those cases mentioned in Article 294 of the Convention. In addition, no application for permission to intervene has been filed before the tribunal on the basis either of Article 31 of the statute or Article 32 of the statute. This is in contrast with a recent practice of the ICJ. And um, if time permits, and although this is not the specific matter dealt with by the panelists in their presentation, but uh, perhaps if uh, they wish to share their thoughts, why there has been little use of incidental proceedings before the tribunal. And I will turn now to the topics, specific topics presented by Judge Leinsat and Dr. Devaney, prompt release and provisional measures respectively taking, of course, the opportunity to thank them for their lucid uh, presentation as uh, stated by Professor Lee. Prompt release of vessel and crews is a unique procedure for uh, various reasons. The tribunal exercises a residual and compulsory jurisdiction to deal with an urgent situation, namely the detention of vessels and crews. This jurisdiction is exercised independently of any choice of procedure made by uh, state parties under Article 287 of the Convention or expression of consent by the respondent state. Judge Leinsat explained that theoretically another 287 court or tribunal could be uh, engaged, but so far uh, this has not been the case. Prompt release is a limited procedure which would apply when specific provisions of the Convention require the coastal state which has detained a vessel to release the vessel and crew upon the posting of a reasonable bond. As stated by a Judge Leinsat, according to the Tribunal's jurisprudence, these provisions relate to two situations, alleged fisheries offences, Article 73, Paragraph 2 of the Convention, and alleged violation of uh, marine environmental standards, Article 220 and 226 of the Convention. I had prepared a question for Judge Leinsat, but I think she, she already answered it. But perhaps if she has further thoughts about this idea of a non-restrictive interpretation of Article 292 in light of that article of Professor Travis uh, saying that perhaps prompt release could also be used in cases where uh, the detention under the convention, uh, 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 in cases of illegal detention of a, a vessel under the convention. So whether a prompt release procedure could apply to the detention of vessels and crews on other grounds. The scope of the tribunal's uh, jurisdiction is limited uh, to the question of release and any decision is without prejudice to the merits of any case before the appropriate domestic forum. Um, another striking feature uh, of this uh, procedure is that the application may be made by or on 
behalf of the flag state. Uh, this was noted by Judge Leinsat, uh, stating this is a very unusual situation in international litigation, the fact that the application may be made on behalf of the flag state. And um, uh, the question which arises here is why do ship owners not make more use of Article 292 procedures? Proceedings for prompt release are both speedy and practical. Once an application for prompt release is filed, the tribunal must deal with it without delay. So the clock starts ticking uh, uh, once the application for prompt release is filed. We were in this situation last Thursday on uh, 10 November when uh, the application uh, from the Marshall Islands was filed against Equatorial Guinea. The tribunal provide the tribunal's rules provide for short time limits for uh, this procedure, a statement and response to be filed 96 hours before the uh, the um, date for the opening of the hearing, and the hearing is to be fixed uh, uh, forthwith. Uh, within a time limit of 15 days. It's a very complicated formula, but more or less 15 days after the filing of uh, the uh, application. This procedure has served as an official tool to obtain the release of uh, vessels and crews. Um, the very first case dealt with by the tribunal was an application for prompt release the Saiga 1 uh, case, and as uh, stated by Judge Leinsat, the last prompt release judgments were rendered by the tribunal in 2007. And nevertheless, a few days ago, this application concerning the uh, release of the empty heroic Edon was submitted um, on uh, 10 November, the case was removed on 15 November. Earlier in 2001, an uh, um, application for the release of the Shai Siri Reefer was submitted on 3rd July and removed 10 days later in, uh, on the 13th of July of 2001. A fundamental aspect in the proceedings has been to assess the reasonableness of the bond set by the detaining state. And I mentioned the first case um, submitted to ITLOS was a prompt release. Um, uh, at that time, uh, this was in, in 1997, I was already a, a young legal officer at the tribunal and we uh, remember the question of dealing with this concept of reasonableness of the bond. The convention does not indicate what is meant by uh, this term and Judge Lines had referred to some of the factors that the tribunal has taken into account to assess the reasonableness of bonds in these uh, prompt release cases that dealt with alleged fishing, fisheries uh, offenses. And uh, Judge Leinsat um, rightly pointed out that no application for release has been submitted for detention on the basis of a violation of marine environmental rules. Since the criteria for reasonableness of the bond has been given in the context of fisheries cases, although uh, the provisions, the marine environmental provisions in Articles 20 to 20 and 226 are rather intricate provision as pointed out by Judge lines that whether these criteria developed by the tribunal in fishing cases would apply, would be relevant for determining 
the reasonableness of a bond in environmental cases? This would be a question for the later discussion. And the last point is um, that, um, of course, a prompt release is available to seek not only the release of the vessel, but also the release of the crew. And in some cases, the tribunal has ordered the release of uh, the crew. But in light of the limited jurisdiction of the tribunal to deal only with the question of release, to which extent could this um, humanitarian concern be taken into account, in particular in relation to paragraph 3 and 4 of Article 73. I turn now to provisional measures, uh, as pointed out by Dr. Devaney. This is an inherent function. Um, uh, it is inherent to the judicial function. And um, thus, um, the tribunal has the power to prescribe provisional measures when cease of the merits of the dispute pursuant to Article 290, Paragraph 1 of the Convention. But also, the tribunal was given compulsory and a residual jurisdiction in provisional measures under Article 290, Paragraph 5. This uh, jurisdiction uh, may be exercised by the tribunal here again, independently of any choice of procedure made under Article 287. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, dispute uh, must first be submitted to Annex 7 arbitration, and the request for provisional measures must be included in the arbitral notification after two weeks, the request can be submitted to the tribunal. As we heard from Professor Devaney, the Convention Article 290 bears similarities with Article 41 of the ICJ statute. Provisional measures are discretionary. They belong to the incidental jurisdiction of the tribunal and they aim at preserving rights of the parties. At the same time, Article 290 has introduced some important innovation, innovations, the effect they are binding upon the parties as the tribunal may prescribe provisional measure, but this is now a standard uh, effect as explained uh, by Professor Devaney. Uh, um, the provisional measures pursuant to Article 290, Paragraph 3, may be uh, 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 prescribed at the request of the parties. The parties shall comply promptly with any provisional measures prescribed. And on this basis, the rules in Article 95 provide that the tribunal may follow up the measure it has ordered by requesting the parties to submit reports on compliance. Professor Devaney touched upon this matter, um, uh, considering this a matter of routine. Um, if he perhaps could further elaborate on the usefulness of the reports on compliance, and whether this tool may be useful as well to other international courts or tribunal. The scope of provisional measures under Article uh, uh, 290, as he has indicated, is broad, not only to preserve the respective rights of the parties, but they also serve to prevent serious harm to the marine environment. And in this context, um, uh, it has been stated, for example, by the late Judge Mensa, that provisional measures are of an exceptional nature to be ordered only in cases where such special uh, measures are considered necessary and appropriate. 
And in light of the comments made by Professor uh, Devaney of a wider function of provisional measures in relation uh, uh, to the uh, marine environment, whether he can further elaborate uh, as to whether this will go beyond the perhaps uh, exceptional nature of uh, provisional uh, measures. Um, I had some um, further items to be addressed, but uh, I think in time, in light of the time, I will just um, 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 touch upon a last issue, the urgency, and a question to Professor Devaney whether he could further elaborate on the requirement of urgency, uh, uh, the difference between paragraph one uh, um, dealing with uh, requiring urgency and what has been considered urgency and what is to be considered urgency in uh, um, paragraph five of uh, the convention, whether there is any difference uh, um, uh, between paragraph one and five uh, uh, relating to uh, urgency. I will uh, uh, stop uh, here um, in order to um, allow uh, time also to the other discussant and uh, the panelists uh, to, to answer. Uh, it has been a pleasure to participate even um, online uh, in this uh, uh, conference. And uh, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hen Henriks, for your uh, uh, very insightful comments. And at the same time, uh, you raised some, some questions, to, uh, put some questions to, uh, to Judge uh, Lanzer and then to, uh, Professor Devaney. And so before giving the floor to them, uh, let me invite uh, uh, Mr. Lowenstein, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. It's a tremendous honor to share the stage, both virtually and in person, with such distinguished experts in the field. Um, in light of the time, I'll, I will be concise in my comments, but I hope you will indulge me in allowing me to express my deep appreciation to the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Tribunal, and the Korean Society of International Law for once again organizing such a superlative conference. I had the great pleasure of attending this conference in past years, and it was a gaping hole in my academic life to not attend in person during the pandemic, and I'm just beyond thrilled to be able to attend once again. Um, so hats off to the organizers for outdoing themselves this year. As I was preparing to give my, co preparing my comments for this panel, I, I reflected on what made me so enthusiastic about being a discussant on this particular panel in light of all the fascinating topics that are being discussed or were discussed in the other panels. And on reflection, I think it's that this set of topics really encapsulates the issues of effectiveness that are form, form the core of this year's conference theme. Um, and issues of effectiveness are, are issues that I find personally extremely interesting, particularly if, um, coming from my perspective as a practitioner who represents states before international courts and tribunals. Because in the course of representing clients or states, issues of effectiveness are necessarily at the forefront. Cases are not litigated in the abstract, they're litigated in a way that involves concrete issues, concrete disputes, and concrete objectives. And issues of effectiveness permeate uh, probably every decision um, that council makes in conjunction um, with the, the state that the council's uh, representing and advising. Um, and so that, I think it's nowhere more true than with respect to proceedings involving prompt release or provisional measures. And what I'd like to do is just highlight, uh, drawing from the presentations we just heard, um, four points where I think um, issues of, of effectiveness are particularly salient. Um, the first concerns the relationship 
between ITLOS and its exercise of jurisdiction with respect to provisional measures and other courts and tribunals. As was discussed under Article 290, Paragraph 5, ITLOS's jurisdiction to entertain provisional measure requests in relation to um, arbitrations that have commenced under Annex 7 and has jurisdiction to enter a provisional measures order to prevent irreparable harm during the interval between the provisional measures request and the constitution and functioning of the forthcoming Annex 7 tribunal. So this, I think, immediately raises issues of effectiveness, particularly the effectiveness of the forthcoming Annex 7 tribunal. Um, because the decision that the tribunal renders in relation to the provisional measures order will almost necessarily have an impact on the scope and discretion of the forthcoming Annex 7 tribunal. To, to give an example, um, as was discussed earlier, um, a great many of the provisional measures cases that ITLOS has heard um, concerns the detention of vessels and requests for the release of those vessels. Um, and if such relief is ordered as an interim measure prior to the pendency, prior to the constitution of the Annex 7 Tribunal, that will obviously have an effect on the ability of the Annex 7 Tribunal um, to um, decide how to deal with that situation. Um, so there's questions of effectiveness um, that relate to the relationship between the tribunal and the Annex 7 um, uh, arbitration tribunal. Uh, you can also see a, a similar relationship of effectiveness with respect to domestic courts. Um, as was also mentioned, um, a great many provisional measures applications concern matters in which there are pending domestic court proceedings. This might arise in the context of the application of domestic criminal law. It might arise in the context of environmental concerns where a domestic court might be overseeing, for example, um, matters relating to uh, environmental impact assessment. Um, and so what the tribunal does with respect to a application for provisional measures can have an impact or put another way, have a, a, a consequence for the effectiveness of domestic um, litigation procedures. Now, which is not at all to say that it's inappropriate for the tribunal to uh, render decisions concerning um, domestic court proceedings or have that an impact on domestic court proceedings, but it is to recognize the fact that those decisions taken in the context of a provisional measures application may in fact have consequences for those domestic court procedures. Uh, the second point in relation to effectiveness in the context of uh, provisional measures uh, concerns the rights of the parties themselves. Um, now, obviously, uh, the um, a request for provisional measures is, is intended to uh, protect from irreparable prejudice uh, the rights of the applicant, that is, the proponent of the provisional measures request. Um, and that is, of course, an entirely legitimate um, use of a provisional measures application. Um, but it's also equally true um, that the respondent state uh, may also have uh, rights um, that might be uh, impacted or prejudiced um, by a provisional measures uh, decision. Um, so, for example, um, uh, in, in the Pulp Mills case, uh, this is before the ICJ, um, the provisional measures application um, that was made by Argentina um, sought a order from the court uh, that would have uh, prevented the construction of uh, the proposed pulp mill. Um, now, it's true that um, uh, the court would have rendered ultimately a decision on the merits, um, which in theory might have allowed the, the uh, project to continue at some point in the future. Um, but the reality of the situation uh, is often that a stay of the nature that was sought in um, the Pulp Mills case um, would have the realistic impact of, of causing the project proponent to abandon the project. Um, and that has consequences for 
things like the right to sustainable development on the part of the respondent state. You can also see this as well in the context of uh, the application of, of, of criminal law. Um, so uh, with respect to um, requests for provisional measures that relate to a uh, request to uh, release a vessel um, during the pendency of domestic criminal uh, proceedings, um, that obviously may have an impact on the ability of the respondent state um, to uh, effectuate uh, future prosecution. Um, now, um, this is particularly uh, salient because as Judge Paik uh, um, acknowledged in his uh, separate uh, um, opinion in the Enrico Lexi case, and as Judge Hadar um, also noted in his opinion um, in the San Padre Pio um, case, um, states not only have a, um, a right um, to exercise criminal um, uh, jurisdiction, they actually have a duty um, to do that. And so there is the um, realistic prospect uh, that a provisional measures application could render ineffective um, that obligation or indeed even duty. Now, um, ITLOS has been quite innovative in addressing um, these types of concerns, and I'd like to uh, highlight uh, two of them. Um, the first concerns the uh, requirement um, that uh, um, a release of a vessel um, be contingent upon the posting of a bond. Um, now, this is an innovation that it was imported essentially from the um, um, prompt release context into the provisional m m measures context, and it was uh, first arose in the context of the Arctic Sunrise case. Um, but what's interesting about the Arctic Sunrise um, case was that the tribunal um, made the release of the vessel um, contingent upon the posting of financial security, but it didn't require the posting of, this, of the financial security. It basically um, decided that um, if the Netherlands uh, posted a bond, then um, the uh, Russian Federation would be obligated um, to release um, the Arctic Sunrise and the individuals who had been uh, t detained with it. Um, that actually is different than the later provisional measures decision in the San Padre T Pio case, um, where uh, ITLOS took a, what might be characterized as a much more aggressive uh, stance. Um, and it did so in, in, in two respects. Um, first, the provisional measures order um, affirmatively required um, Switzerland as the flag state um, to provide uh, security in that instance in the amount of um, 14 million dollars. So unlike in the Arctic Sunrise case, where it was discretionary on the part of the flag state. In, in the San Pedro Pio case, uh, it was an affirmative obligation on the part of, of Switzerland. Um, and, and that was paired uh, with, with another obligation uh, that was imposed on Switzerland, uh, which was that Switzerland was required uh, to provide a undertaking um, that the individuals who were subject to criminal prosecution in Nigeria um, would be available and present um, in Nigeria for the continuation of prosecution should Nigeria ultimately prevail on the merits on the question of whether uh, the detention of the vessel um, had complied uh, with the convention. Um, and again, so this is a quite innovative um, approach um, to affirmatively require um, these types of, of undertakings. And it was particularly aggressive in that context um, because the individuals at issue were not Swiss nationals. They were nationals of Ukraine. Um, and so um, it provided a quite you know, burdensome um, obligation on the part of the flag state. The third point I would raise concerns um, the plausibility of rights in dispute. Uh, so plausibility is, is obviously a, a quite low um, threshold. Um, and that while plausibility um, need not, uh, well, while, while plausibility um, concerns uh, the, the existence of, of, of a right, it also needs to be uh, assessed 
in the context of the relevant facts and circumstances uh, of the case. Um, but what's sort of interesting and a question that might be worth pondering um, is what role, if any, um, should considerations of the relative strength of the claims and defenses play? Um, plausibility um, might be the threshold um, for determining whether uh, provisional measures uh, might be required. And a question that would be worth considering is whether issues about the relative strength of the claims and defenses might have a role to play in relation to what provisional measures um, might be ordered by the tribunal. Um, and then fourth, um, I'll just conclude um, by um, mentioning um, the issues concerning protection and preservation of the marine environment, which again is one of the tremendous inno innovations um, under UNCLOS, um, particularly as it relates to provisional measures. Um, one of the issues that, that arise in this particular context um, is given the expedited procedures um, that are necessarily involved in provisional measures proceedings is the difficulty of establishing one way or another um, whether um, environmental um, harm is likely to result um, sufficient to justify uh, provisional measures. And, and one of the ways I believe that ITLOS has, has dealt with this um, is uh, by adopting the position first in the Southern Bluefin Tuna um, proceeding um, and then later um, repeated, uh, a, a, essentially a version of a standard that is, is tantamount um, to the precautionary principle, um, which again is, is, I think, a quite innovative um, approach. Um, I know that we want to save time for, for questions, so I think I will um, leave it there um, and, and uh, turn the uh, floor back over to Professor Lee. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for your uh, very succinct and at the same time very insightful comments. Well, uh, looks like we have uh, less than 10 minutes left for this session. Um, so. Uh, I think it would be rather difficult for me to uh, collect questions from the floor. So uh, uh, we'll just utilize the remaining time uh, uh, for, the, for, for our uh, presenters to uh, respond to the questions and comments made by our discussants. Okay, so uh, let me first give the floor to, uh, to uh, James. Thank you. You can go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, both, for for those thoughts. I, I think I'm going to sh shamelessly cherry pick some of the questions that I would like uh, to answer, rather than than trying to be exhaustive. I think, uh, first of all, uh, on the issue of uh, the usefulness of, of a reporting obligation, um, I, I think perhaps uh, Judge Lainzad would be best placed as to how useful these are, in fact, for the tribunal. And so maybe I can limit myself to to think a bit about whether this would be more useful practice for other international courts uh, and tribunals. Uh, on reflection, I would say that I can certainly see the case for this. Uh, I think more generally, if we think about international courts and tribunals, uh, especially arbitral tribunals, uh, as existing to settle the dispute at, at hand, um, then there is less of a case for thinking about reporting obligations after a judgment has been rendered. But certainly in relation to provisional measures, uh, pending the um, decision on the merits, I, I can see a, a compelling case uh, for um, keeping the parties engaged, especially in relation to provisional measures that have uh, been ordered. So. And this, of course, will depend uh, from context to context. In cases of non-appearance, then reporting obligations will be similarly futile. But uh, if we have two engaged parties, then uh, I think that could be potentially useful before uh, other uh, international courts uh, and tribunals. Andrew, I was really uh, intrigued by your s suggestion that in terms of plausibility, we may already at that stage start to think about maybe trying to to consider the relative strength of claims when uh, tribunals are, are considering the, the measures that uh, are ordered. Uh, I, I can see the utility of doing this particularly in relation to, say, um, Ukraine-Russia recently, where you had very far-reaching uh, measures there, perhaps even measures that were not 
specifically re requested by the parties, but I think my gut instinct would be that it would be better to avoid getting involved too much in the substance uh, at the stage of provisional measures and bearing in mind the rationale is simply preserving the rights of the parties before they uh, are heard uh, on the merits. Um, similarly, on the um, point uh, relating to harm uh, and the marine uh, environment, I think it certainly seems that we have some suggestions, if not of a precautionary principle as a legal principle, but at least a precautionary approach uh, from the uh, various uh, tribunals. The issue of harm uh, really is uh, one which I think is uh, going to be the key and will be what uh, any future cases uh, on protection of the, of the marine environment will essentially turn on. And if we had more time, we could maybe have gone a bit more uh, into the detail uh, of a potential request for provisional measures from Korea against Japan and considered what would serious harm uh, look like in that particular context. I think that is a fascinating issue because there you would essentially have the tribunal confronted with the International Atomic Energy Agency saying this uh, is not harmful, uh, and yet a precautionary approach taken by the tribunal uh, in the past, which may suggest that uh, the tribunal may want to, at least at the provisional measure stage, diverge from the expertise of the IAEA. I think that would be really a fascinating uh, issue on which uh, would probably we would need to have expert uh, input uh, as well. So. Um, I will limit uh, myself to these uh, responses so far uh, and uh, yeah, pass the floor over to, to Judge Lainzad. Okay. Thank you, James. And uh, uh, Judge Lainzad, please. Well, um, uh, briefly, um, I, to a number of the questions raised by the Registrar, th thank you for being with us today. Um, as to uh, the question whether for prompt release, it's only those two issues, or whether perhaps we should consider that there are other possibilities as well. If I recall correctly, but I must say that's really off the top of my, my mind, um, I believe that Judge Trevis was referring to provisions like 216 and 218. So this, I think, would be uh, more extending um, the scope of the potential scope of prompt release measures in, with respect to uh, uh, pollution and, and um, a protection of the marine environment. Um, I must say that I haven't really looked at that in great detail, but it seems to me that there are good reasons, um, really in the sense of treaty interpretation reasons to say, well, uh, frankly, if you look at the development of the text of the convention, there are these two situations that were identified as relevant situations, uh, uh, um, situations in which uh, there's a potential violation of domestic, um, uh, domestic um, um, law, um, domestic standards, um, and those two situations are covered uh, by the protection that could potentially be offered by prompt release. Now, what I have been thinking about, and this makes it, uh, and, and that is really a, a complex reflection, given that we do not have any case law so far with respect to uh, marine pollution and prompt release, in terms of um, if you see litigation from the perspective of these are steps that states take uh, when they really need them. Uh, so from the perspective of environmental protection, I need an urgent procedure. There is, of course, always um, the availability of um, provisional measures rather than prompt release. But I'm not sure that I agree with myself on that point, given that those are quite different pr uh, procedures. Uh, given the fact that prompt release is, it's, very, it's a very strange procedure, a good procedure. I mean, I'm not criticizing it, but my ob observation is it's an intriguing procedure because it is an international procedure that is about a domestic procedure, a domestic situation. 
even though it's it's not directly mixed in that or something. They're, they're different, different procedures. Whereas uh, I think that with respect to um, provisional measures, you would have to look for an underlying case, etc. So uh, it's uh, from the perspective, and this is a more the perspective of a, a particular state, if that state is facing a particular environmental problem and they want an urgent, me uh, urgent measure, well, for prompt release, that would require that they would have uh, somehow arrested the ship. The ship is sitting somewhere and you're saying, no, you can't be released because the ship has created, uh, has violated my law, or perhaps this, the ship, this is in 226, the ship isn't even seaworthy, so I can't let it go because the ship in itself is an environmental danger. Um, or in the alternative, um, you would, I think, have to have some sort of underlying case in which you could say, hey, well, we now need provisional measures because the situation is so urgent from a, an environmental perspective, so we need to act. Something that I started to think about, I should add, in preparing my talk is about, well, we have these two urgent proceedings, uh, and they are quite substantive proceedings. And both of them refer to environment. So what's the link? Is there a link? Or are they completely distinct? Or is there perhaps some sort of a crossover? Um, now, that's only thoughts. I haven't come to any conclusion on that. So, um, um, but but uh, I do think, in general, that it would be very valuable if there would be more of an exploration of, well, what does this mean, this prompt release procedure? in case of violations of environmental law. It might be able to sort of, I don't know, give some publicity to that. It's now, it's, it might be the sleeping beauty of the convention, we just don't know. But that's perhaps always the case with sleeping beauties. I'll pass the microphone to my neighbor. Um, Andrew, do you have anything, anything to, to, to add? No, I'm happy to cede the floor to you. <laughs> well, uh, I think t our, our time, is, uh, time is up. So, uh, well, uh, um, there was, I, I see a hand raised uh, from, the, from the floor. Um, can, you be, can you be really uh, very prompt in, uh, in raising your question? Yeah. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll just uh, collect just one question, yeah. and then we'll wrap up uh, this uh, session. Thank you, Professor Lee, and I'm sorry to catch all the participants in hostage at the last minute. Well, uh, taking uh, this rare opportunity, I could not uh, 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 help it. Well, uh, Dr. Divani briefly mentioned the planned discharge of treated uh, radioactive waters from Okushima, which is supported by the IAEA. And as I understand it, the former president of Korea, uh, President Moon, uh, instructed the government to explore every possibility of taking this case to the laws, including uh, provisional measures. And I believe which may be possible or not, but nevertheless, uh, it might be possible as well. So I'd like to listen uh, to uh, Dr. Divani and also Mr. Rubenstein, uh, their, uh, their assessment, their assessment uh, as to how important, how crucial the IAEA's views on this particular case will be and also how reliable or trustworthy of the IAEA's views in delivering this particular case, uh, including uh, provisional measures. And uh, I'm very much interested in listening from each of you on this particular point. Thank you. 
uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Lim, for your question. But, uh, well, um, I think uh, Professor Devaney's point was that whether uh, we can more actively utilize the provisional measure uh, procedure for the protection of marine environment. So I think he mentioned specifically this case between Korea, uh, this, let's say, uh, uh, issue between Korea and Japan in that context. So if we go into a more detailed discussion of this, uh, 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 this question, I think probably we need some more time and uh, we are, we are you know, already uh, 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 a bit behind schedule. So maybe um, I'd like to suggest a compromise. So uh, uh, probably after this session, uh, Maybe uh, um, Devaney, maybe Professor Devaney and uh, Mr. Lowenstein. Uh, maybe you can have a, a discussion between us. Uh, I think that I hope there'll be a compromise we can we can live with. Uh, is, is it agreeable to you, uh, Ambassador? All right. Okay. All right. And I think uh, we have to uh, close our session uh, uh, here. Well. Uh, the, I think the key word of the, uh, this conference is effectiveness of the uh, UNCLOS regime. And uh, through this dis discussion, it, be it became clear. Even though the term uh, uh, incidental or special uh, uh, proceedings may, uh, uh, may, uh, uh, it, it may sound a bit uh, I mean, ancillary or rather peculiar, but at the same time, we realize that uh, these proceedings are quite important or is essential in uh, uh, securing or in guaranteeing the effectiveness of the UNCLOS regime, especially part of 15 of, uh, of UNCLOS. So uh, I think uh, uh, we had a very, um, we have been enlightened by our panelists, excellent panelists. And uh, so I'd like to uh, uh, ask, ask you to join me in expressing our thanks to our panelists uh, by giving them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee and all the speakers for the wonderful speech and discussions. Once again, please give a big round of applause for Professor Lee and all our speakers, both online and on floor. Thank you. Now, that concludes all the sessions for today for the seventh International Conference on the Law of the Sea. And I hope that today's sessions were constructive and helpful to all of you. And thank you for your participation.